So we continue our, our series on, we're not, we're, we are on an intermission on Genesis. We will just be out for eight weeks to cover just the eight Beatitudes. And um, last week we saw the first. Blessed are the poor in spirit for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. These are the people approved by God. They are poor in spirit. To them and them alone is the kingdom of God. What the? Just, just me saying that is a message in itself if you meditate on it. Now, today we're looking at the second beatitude. Now, try to imagine if you were living at the turn of the century here in the Philippines. By the, at that time, um, we were still under the Spaniards. And at that time, you know, last Monday, me and Bettina, we went to Luneta Park. It's National Heroes Day, right? We went to Luneta Park and uh, Rizal Park. And we just, maybe we were walking, we were looking at all the statues there, all the, the heroes. And most of them are, are uh, heroes against the Spaniards. Because we, I think we were under the Spaniards for about 400 years or so. And try to imagine you were living at that time, uh, during, during that time, and you're living in Bulacan or living in Cavite, where a lot of the resistance happened. And during that time, if you're, you're living in that place, talks about resistance to the Spaniards was very strong. A lot of people want to break away from the Spaniards, from the shackles of Spain. And you would hear the concept about brave, being brave, being bold, being strong, having pride, being rich, being conquerors. Filipino at the time was egging to, to, to break out with, 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 uh, with the shackles of Spain. Now, you have to remember when, when the Beatitude was spoken, they were in a similar state. The Jews were shackled. And what? They were waiting for a Redeemer. They were waiting for a new king. A new king who would bring them out, take a second exodus, not out of Egypt, but pushing out the Romans out of the occupied place. Revolutionary violence was appropriate at that time. In fact, some of the disciples of Jesus were zealots. These are the people that were fighting the MPAs, in a sense. And, and, and the words and the, and the sentiment at that time was, we need to have a, a final war, an arms war against the Romans to establish the new kingdom. So, so the concept of being brave, being bold, being strong, taking arms was prevalent in establishing the new kingdom. But here when Jesus was describing the kingdom, it was totally different from the concept of the kingdom that needs to be established. The reality there is are totally different. Blessed are those who mourn. What? Maybe blessed are those who are brave. Blessed are those who are courageous. No, no. Blessed are those who mourn. Nowadays, to be blessed is not, you know, mourning is not being considered you are blessed because you are mourning. Maybe if you are happy, then you are blessed. Even, even in churches today, right? The concept of mourning is, the concept of being blessed is also different. Religion tells us that if you're happy, if you have a positive outlook, 
if your everything is going fine in your life, then you're blessed. Oh, you have a new deal, oh brother, you're so blessed. <clears throat> right? It's it's all about improving self-esteem, making you feel good. But what the beatitude uh, what the beatitude is describing is this. It is profiling who are the authentic Christians. How do you know that you are an authentic Christian? This is like a lithium test. Are you poor in spirit? Do you mourn? Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Are you merciful? Are you pure in heart? Are you a peacemaker? Are you being persecuted? These are the traits of people that will enter the kingdom. We're looking at Beatitude number two, two, Matthew 5 verse 4. It reads, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's the second Beatitude. Now the second Beatitude, the Beatitudes are not a multiple choice. Wherein you can choose this one, this one, but this I will not take. It's too difficult. To be persecuted? Uh, no way. To be a peacemaker? Hmm. Not sure about that. The beatitude is an all or nothing. It's not a pick and choose. Either you have it all or you really don't have it all. It's like the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the priest is love. The next is patient, kind. The patient and kind there are, they call it an opposition, wherein it's describing what love is. Remember, the, the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. The second, third, fourth just explains that. It shows a different facets. So you cannot say, I'll have this or have that. Either you have all eight or you don't have it. So blessed are those who mourn. This is not optional. <coughs> Mourning is not optional, it's not incidental, and it's non-negotiable. For it is foundational and fundamental. And what Jesus is saying is the people that has been approved by God is characterized by mourning. You know, honestly, I haven't heard much message on mourning. In fact, this morning, I was saying, what's a good song to sing about mourning, blah, blah. So I was searching. There's basically none. And I thought, well, you know, I'll probably write a song. <coughs> no, really, I, I'm really thinking, well, at, at least there should be one good repentance mourning song. But we could sing, right? Go to Luke chapter 6, please. Luke chapter 6, verse 21. And it says, Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. 25. Jump to verse 25. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. <coughs> Woe to you who laughs now, for you shall mourn and weep. <clears throat> what is Jesus saying here? You have a choice. But the point is, we will all mourn. The question is when. Either you mourn now and laugh later, or laugh now 
and mourn later. Either way, you will mourn. That's what the Bible says. Right? Mourn now, and you will laugh later. Or, have a good time now, and, and mourn later. That's why that book, and you know, I seldom criticize, but I will criticize this book. The best life now. Huh? That's wrong. Our best life is not now. If your best life is now, then what comes when you die is the worst life. It's hell. For us who are saved, the best is yet to come. This is full of tears. If full of pain. If it's full of agony. It's full of mourning. But this is not our final stop. So the best life now is not the best life now. For us Christians, it is yet to come. But for unbelievers, enjoy it. Your best life is now. So the Bible is clear. You will mourn. Either now, or you will mourn later. Go to John chapter 16, please. John chapter 16. Verse 20 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. What Jesus is saying is the people of God will be known for what? They'll be characterized by mourning. But that's okay because in the end, that mourning will turn into joy. Hmm. Interesting. Go to Isaiah 53. And we're going to verses so that you see that these teachings is super ingrained in scripture. It's not, I'm surprised now, it's super ingrained, yet people don't preach about it. And even, the, I couldn't find a song. <coughs> Isaiah 53, verse 3, it's talking about Jesus. He was despised and forsaken of men. A man of sorrow, acquainted would grief. A man of sorrow, that's Jesus. Acquainted with grief. Nowhere will you find in the Bible, there's no record that Jesus ever laughed. Not that he did not laugh, huh? if I, I may say. But there's none. We see he was hungry, he was thirsty, he wept, he was sad. But we don't see him. He was laughing. He, he, he's, he was characterized by sorrow and acquainted with grief. He and his teaching, blessed are those who mourn. These are the people that has been approved by me. This is a sign that you are a genuine believer. What? You are mourning. Go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 9. Says, Be miserable, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy to gloom. So unpopular theme. It's almost the message that was never preached or seldom preached. What Jesus is saying is that this is absolutely necessary in our spiritual life 
if we are to have a spiritual life, we are to be mourned, mournful. This is necessary in our spiritual life if we are to have a real spiritual life. You cannot skirt this. You cannot pass this on. You cannot be exempted. It's part and parcel of a Christian life. A person that is mournful. Now people, they mourn, right? Or they feel sad or they cry on a good movie. A tearjerker. Or when somebody breaks them up in a love relationship. Some people, they, they, they mourn when their team loses. When they have a financial loss. In other case, some people mourn for the evil of this world. For the corruption. For the abortion. For the social injustice. But the morning here, used in Genesis, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, is the strongest term for morning. There are nine words in Greek for morning. From the little sorrow, the lightest, to the highest end. What Jesus used here was the highest end type of morning. It is usually used for the lamentation for the dead. A son standing in front of the grave of a father or mother or a father or mother standing at the grave of the unsuspected death of the son. And in grief that they experience, they cannot hide their feelings. It is visible. It is noticeable. A child, a father, mother who just died and you are there crying, weeping, lamenting, mourning for the loss. That is the type. That is the word that is being described here. Now, question. What are we mourning about? Blessed are those who mourn. Mourn about what? Well, we are to mourn what the previous beatitude says. Which is what? Poor in spirit. The only adequate and appropriate response of anyone who understands that they are poor in spirit is what? They will mourn. It is a natural flow. You realize your foreign spirit, then you mourn. The first beatitude tells us what? We are spiritually bankrupt. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can present. In fact, all we have to present to God is our sin. The second beatitude is how we respond to that recognition. But we don't have any spiritual capital to commend ourselves to God. So, the second beatitude tells us it is not enough that we recognize that we are spiritually bankrupt. To simply say that we are sinners is not enough. Okay, I'm a sinner, then let's move on. No. What the second spiritual, uh, what the second beatitude is saying is that you recognize that you are a sinner and that truth sinks deep down to your very core that you mourn. That you grieve over it. Because you realize it is that sin that crucified Christ. That that sin is an act of rebellion against a loving father. So mourning here is not mourning about whatever. You know, I've seen and I've heard messages, oh, you mourn because of this situation, this situation, and God will comfort you. That's not the mourning here. 
It's mourning of your sins. There must be a sense of brokenness in you. If we sin and it does not lead us to mourning, I mean, we should question ourselves. Because sin should lead us to mourning. Go to Luke chapter 7, please. Luke 7, verse 36. And it says, Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at the table, that's Jesus. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Now, realize, everyone in that city was a sinner. Oh, no one there in that city was not, was not a sinner. But when it says that was a sinner, what that means is that girl has a reputation that she is a notorious sinner. Some commentators is saying probably she's a prostitute or an adulterer. And she was out and out about it. She was not ashamed. It was public knowledge. That's why she was a sinner. And she learned that he, meaning Jesus, was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster veil of perfume. An alabaster veil of perfume would cost you about one year's salary. Very expensive perfume. One year's salary. Probably she was not invited here because a Pharisee would not invite such a woman. They dare not mingle with not only a sinner, a notorious sinner. Not only that, a female notorious sinner. Verse 38. And standing behind me, behind him, this woman realized that she was not worthy. Like, like last week, right? The tax collector stand at the back of the temple, feeling that he was not worthy to approach. This woman was standing behind Jesus feeling also unworthy at his feet. Hands and feet at the feet, what? Weeping. Wailing, crying, visibly, seen by all. Try to imagine that. You're in the party, your teacher was there, and a, 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 a no good sinful person comes in and makes a scene. She was making a scene at the floor, weeping, Lord, Lord. And she began to wet his feet with her tears. Not with water, with her own tears. She was crying. And she wept them with the hair of her head. She was weeping exactly what Jesus called for, right? Blessed are those who mourn. And she was wiping it with her hair. You know, a hair is a woman's glory. And what, what that symbolizes is she was laying down her glory at the feet of her Savior. Doing what? And kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. The weeping there means uncontrollable weeping. Wow. Take her out. She's creating a scene where he tried to imagine Pastor Peter giving a message 
in, in the middle of the church and a girl comes there crying and weeping. Call the ushers and the guards. Take her out of this place. She's disturbing the message. Hmm. Verse 39. Now the Pharisee who, who had invited him saw this and said to him, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of a person this woman is touching him, that she is a sinner. Well, if that man is a prophet, he would know that what was on their heart. Verse 40. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Listen up. And, we, and he replied, Simon replied, Say it, teacher. You know, a money lender had two. Two debtors. One owned him 100 denarii, the other 50. During that time, 50 denarii was staggering. 500 denarii was more staggering. It's a big, these are huge amounts. When they were able, were, when they were able to pay, he graciously forgave them both. Out of his grace, out of his mercy, asking for nothing. I forgive you and I forgive you. You owe me five pesos, you owe me 50 pesos. I both forgive you. Which one of them will love him more? Do the math. Come on, Simon. Do the math. Who will love me more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. The one who owed more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. That is correct. 44. Turning towards the woman, he said to Simon. So she faced the woman and spoke to Simon. Do you see this woman? The one to you who's creating a scandal. Do you see her? I entered their house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears. In Greek, that was emphasis, eh? with her tears. And wiped them with her hair. That was the emphasis. 45, you gave me no kiss. But she, since the time I came, has not ceased kissing my feet. <clears throat> 46, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins which are many, has been forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is, who is forgiven little, loves little. In reality, both these people were great sinners. None was not less than another. Both of them owes trillions and trillions of denarii. But the point is this, she was the only one who was willing to admit she was a great sinner. She admitted it. She was the one who came to grips with her reality. She did not try to cover it up. She, wait, she felt the weight of her sin. At the very core of her soul, she alone mourned for her sin. She alone will be comforted by God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Verse 48, then he said to her, your sins has been forgiven. Do you see that? Both of them are sinners. The only difference is this girl realized 
the gravity of her sin and she mourned about it. While the other person did not mourn. Did not see the gravity of her, their sin. The gravity of all our sins here are all the same. And we should feel all this. We should all feel like that woman. <coughs> that infamous sinner. Go to Acts chapter 2, please. Acts chapter 2. Verse 36. 36 to 37. It says, Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know for certain that the God, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Your sins has crucified him. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced at their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the brethren, Brethren, what shall we do? Now that we realize that our sin was the one that crucified Christ, what tell us? What must or what shall I do? What can I do? Well, we are to mourn for our sins. Go to James chapter 4, please. James chapter 4, verse 8 says, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hand, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 9. Be miserable, and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Now that you realize your sin, be miserable, and mourn and weep. Don't laugh about it, but mourn for it. A person who recognizes their spiritual poverty will do what? They will mourn. And the sad reality is a lot of churches have forgotten to mourn. If there is no mourning in the life of a person, there is no real recognition of their sins. Because a real recognition of our sin will make us mourn. If you see who you are and who God is, you have to mourn. It's the only thing that will happen. It's the only thing. When's the last time have you heard a person mourn of a church mourning for their sins? Yet, this trait should be characterized. It should be a character of all Christians. These are the people approved by God. These are people who mourns. They and they alone will be comforted. Now, what are the aspects of mourning? The first aspect is one has to recognize sin. Confession of sin. That you are agreeing to God that what you done, what you have done, is wrong. You are not telling God something that He does not know. He knows that. He knows your sin. So when you confess a sin, you are just agreeing and telling God, yes, God, I know what I did is wrong. You are right and I'm not. But you know, even that state, some people, they don't even admit their sin. They're a sinner. They don't even admit if they've done wrong. They deny, no, it's not wrong. Huh? What's wrong? I did not sin. I didn't get angry. I didn't steal. I didn't. They have all these excuses. 
then there's no mourning. The first step of mourning is agree to God, yes, God, I did something wrong. Right? Some people, they just, yeah, it was wrong, but I had to do it. They justify. In fact, in some case, they put that act as meritus. No, I had to sacrifice pa nga eh. Yes, it might be wrong, but I had to do it. I was forced. So it's not really wrong. 1 John 1, 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. First step of mourning is recognizing sin. The second step of mourning is this. It moves from confessing our sins to confessing, I'm a sinner. True mourning moves from an act to a character. When me and my wife have a disagreement, and if I have to say sorry, or she has to say sorry to me, it's not enough that I say, Han, I'm sorry that I lied to you, as an example. I should say, sad, ah, sad. Han, I'm sorry that I'm a liar and I lied to you. I have to accept not only that I sin, but I am a sinner. Yes, we are redeemed by God, but we still sin. The third aspect of mourning is this. You agree with God that, you're, that you have sinned, Second, you say not only that you've sinned, but you are a sinner. And third, and most important is this. I have sinned against God. This is where all mourning should end. That ultimately, it was a sin against a loving father. I mentioned this a couple of times. One of the most devilish things to think about is this. We will, we will sin against a sin-forgiving father. That's, that's painful. No? Go to Genesis chapter 39, please. Genesis 39. Verse 9 says, There is no one greater in this house than I, and he would held nothing from me except you. This is Joseph. Because you are his wife, how then could I do this great evil and sin against God? All sin is against God. Go to Psalm 51, please. Psalm 51. Psalm 51 verse 4 says, Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you are judged. Psalm 78 verse 4, 40 says, How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Whenever we sin, we sin against God. And whenever we sin against God, God is grieved. And because God is grieved, we mourn. Because we hurt our Father. I had a small glimpse of this in my life when I hurt my father. And remember, I, it's a defining experience in my case, unforgettable. And uh, I was baptized, Christian Baptist in the swimming pool. And uh, I remember it was Peter Taji who baptized me, Alice Castillo was there. 
They were in Barong Tagalog. They had the karaoke. We were in the pool. They were singing. I was so afraid. Baka makuriyente kami dito. You might get electrocuted. And I had some photos of that day. It's a memorable day. It was in my drawer in my office. In Bendia. Corner, mga tabi niyo. Right? Executive building. And my dad, you know, every so often, he would sit on my table and he would just ramage. Look, I don't see my drawer, blah, 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 blah. He pulled my drawer and he saw the photos. He got it. He's going, no, 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 look at the photo. And my dad saw, yeah. hey, Bob, what's this? You're doing karaoke in the pool? Oh, that's interesting. And then he was saying, Kakaroke pa lang kayo sa swimming pool, ha? As she flips, she saw me going up. <laughs> and he realized it wasn't a karaoke session. I was being baptized in his mind in a cup. And I saw my dad. He did not get angry. But it grieved him. I saw the pain. I really saw the pain in my dad's heart. And because of that pain, I extremely felt bad. Not because I was baptized, I extremely felt bad that I hurt my father's feelings. If that was a sin, then I was grieving. Not per se, the sin I was grieving because of what that sin did to my father, it grieved him because it was an offense against him, him that loved me, who cared for me, who can't understand why do you keep on sinning despite me loving you and continually. The more we realize how much God loves us, the more we will grieve and mourn whenever we sin against Him. That is what mourning is. We mourn for our sin against a holy, loving Father who gave all in order to be you to be His child. You're just adopted. You're not even naturally born. Yet you curse, you answer back. All of us were adopted into the family of God. <clears throat> Yet all of us, we curse. We answer back. And we are immune to the feelings of our Father. We, we don't mourn. We don't grieve. And Jesus is saying, these are the people approved by me. They mourn for their sins against their father. It's a personal grief. A lot of people, they mourn. Why? Because they got caught. A husband who's caught philandering, nahuli ka, ah, crying time. A wife that is caught cheating, ah, crying time morning. Not because they've sinned, because they're caught. Right? They're not sorry because they've hurt their father. They're sorry because now they have to face a consequence of being separated, hurting the kids. And I believe a lot of churches, a lot of people has lost the sense of holiness, grandeur, or oh, majesty, goodness, and love of the Father that they lost that natural response of mourning when we sin. That's why people, they don't mourn anymore. In fact, for some people, they feel good about their sin. 
You know, I find it kind of weird. If you think of it, a lot of people in church, when they sin, ah, don't forget it. God forgive you. It's okay. Move on. What do you mean it's okay? Move on. They're hyper grace. They're hyper for God forgives, brother. But where's room for mourning? No, it's okay, brother. It's okay. It's okay. No, no, no. God, mourn. Mourn for your sins that you've done against against God. Blessed are those who mourn. The word there is present participle. Which means what? It's a habitual lifestyle. It will be a continual thing that will happen to all believers because we all sin. Which we don't see. People, churches, has forgotten how to mourn for their sin. They have. Sabi mo I couldn't find a Christian song. Well, I'm sure there is. I just couldn't find it. Look at how Paul saw his sin. Go to Romans chapter 7. Please. <coughs> Romans chapter 7, verse 15 says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is, is present in me, but the doing of good is not. Verse 19. For the good I want, I do not do. But I practice the evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. O wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Go to 2 Corinthians 7, please. Verse 9. Second <clears throat> Corinthians verse 9 says, I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. Paul is saying, I'm happy that you guys are sorrowful to the point of repentance for you were made sorrowful according to the will of God so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance with regret leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnest this very thing this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourself, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenge of wrong. In everything, you demonstrate yourself to be innocent in the matter. Paul said, I'm happy. I'm happy that you are sorrowful. I'm happy that you are mourning for the sins that you have done. Repent of it. And you will be saved. Mourning, like all traits, repentance, is not a one-time thing. It's not that I mourn once and it's over. No, you mourn once and you mourn more and more and more and more and more. So what does this mourning lead to? Blessed are they who mourn. They will be what? Comforted. It's a future indicative 
conformity. Meaning what? It will surely come. One day, the Father, our Father, in the future, will comfort us. But only them who mourns now will be comforted. There will be an ocean of comfort poured out by our gracious God in the last days. The heavy weight of sin will be rolled out of them. One day, Christ will remove all our sins and all its effect will be delivered not only from the penalty of sin, not only from the consequence of sin, but also from the presence of sin. Therefore, there will be no more pride. There will be no more hate. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more death. Go to Revelations, please. Revelations chapter 21. Verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among us, and He will dwell among us, and they shall be His people, and God Himself will be among them. One day, God will be in our presence. What will He do? In verse 4, And He will wipe away every tear from your eyes and there will be no longer any death there will be there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain the first thing has passed away one day this will all end your mourning christ god will wipe away all your tears. I'm reminded about the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son who sinned against the father and one day he realized how much his father loved him and he ran, uh, he went back to his father, thin, shabby, <coughs> smelling, smelling uh, bad because he was living with pigs and when the father saw him from afar, what does it say? He, he, his stomach turned and churned seeing Seeing his son now, now poor and a, and a beggar, and what did the father do? He ran to his son, taking the shame, and hugged his son, put his head, put his head on his neck, and started kissing him, and saying to his son, "Son, it's okay." The father comforted the son. He wiped, and I'm sure the son was crying and weeping, Dad, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And the dad wiped out his tears, embraced his son, and said, Son, weep no more. You're with me now. That's the promise of God. One day, we will be comforted. John 16, 20 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. These are the people approved by God. They mourn. They cry. They weep. For their sins that they've done against a loving, a holy, a righteous, a patient God. To them, and them will comfort be given by God on judgment day. You will mourn. The question is, either now or in the end, when it's too late. That's what the Bible says. You will mourn. Either now for your sin against God or in the end when you regret that you never mourned for your sins against God. Let us all embrace mourning. May we learn to see who God is. 
And we realize that whenever we sin against our spouse, against our kids, against our employer, against our employee, we are grieving the Father. And may that realization cause us to mourn. Thus says the Lord.